we do a lot of things that don't necessarily bring us an income, but they bring us a following and they bring us connection. Mm. And having connected with people that deeply, they they are not only return customers, but they're sharing us all the time. You know, they open a box of meats and they're sharing us on Instagram. They, you know, un- unpack the bag of meat that they came to the ranch store and bought and they're sharing it. All, every time someone does that, it's free advertising and it really helps. When you think about, is this really worth the return on investment? You can't think about what's you know return on investment this month or next month. You have to think about what's it going to be in two years. Great businesses don't spring up out of nowhere. Building a business involves overcoming challenges, experiencing failures, large and small, and putting in the work, day in and day out. Welcome to Season 3 of the Building Bellingham Podcast. I'm your host, Leo Cohen. Today, Brianna and I sit down and we talk about the importance of branding and social media to connect you directly with your customer base to really share your story. How important is collaboration and creating a platform around food, how it's prepared, where it comes from, and ultimately the people behind it. We talk about how important it is when you're building a business and building a life to narrow your circle, to be around people that lift you up, to encourage you. We also talk a lot about vision, to have your sights set clearly on the, the near future, the midterm, and the far. We talk about the timeline of bacon. The smoking bacon, smoking bacon. Mm. We also talk about how important chicken shit is taking your soil from dead to alive chicken shit and we talk about the bottleneck in the processing world that's making it really difficult for farmers to get their product out there to their consumers and how the hell do chickens continue to lay eggs how no seriously how I think I can speak for our whole building Bellingham team that we were glued to our seats and riveted by the whole story Uh, from day one to now, and also understanding all of the struggles that a farmer and rancher goes through on a daily basis. You're not going to want to miss this episode. Incredibly interesting. Let's dive in. Brianna Wyden, Widner Farms, thank you for joining us in the studio, the building Bellingham studio. Tell me a little bit more about you, who you are, what you do, what do you not do? We absolutely love what we get to do. So we raise pork, beef, chicken, and lamb on our ranch in Custer. And we love being in Whatcom County. And, you know, our community is a little bit more supportive. They're kind of foodies. Mm-hmm. So it really has made this transition from suburban life to to farm life a little bit easier. But we raise livestock. You know, my, my husband and I kind of had this desire to raise our own food. Mm-hmm. And it turned into a, well, our friends needed some and then those friends needed some and then it just kind of grew and grew and Ryan and I both realized we really wanted to do it for a living and so we made the big transition a couple years ago. Transitioning from suburban life to farm life. Tell me more about that experience. (laughs) Right. It's a little less romantic than I think most people think it's going to be. It's a standing joke that we ditched suburban life for gravel roads and and dirty hands but we really did you know we had this this big dream and desire my husband and i were married in 2008 and in 2009 we took a trip to wyoming to visit the ranch the cattle ranch that i had worked on for a few years in college when we were driving out of that driveway and leaving and headed home ryan looked at me and he was like that's a dream gig Like that is a dream job. And we shelved it for a long time because it's not, you can't pay your bills very well. And just kind of went back and got good jobs and kept going and got on this hamster wheel. And then we kind of, we just wanted off. We really wanted off. And so 2017 rolled around and we listed our house and just said, we'll see what happens. Within about 24 hours of it selling the house that, or the the farm that we were looking at came up on the market and we bought it. Yeah. Did you manifest that? Was it just like such a strong vision on what you wanted or what you didn't want? Yeah. It was kind of crazy because we were looking at other places. We had originally, when we moved to Whatcom County in 2011, this farm was on the market. And we were like, God, that'd be so cool. But we couldn't afford it. We were young kids. We were just kind of getting going. We'd never had a house before. It just wasn't an option. So we flipped a house and sold it and then turned around and upgraded to the farm. But it literally was like, we had seen it before. And I even journaled about like what my dream house looked like. Mm -hmm. And we turned around and four years later, opened that notebook and was like, oh my gosh, (laughs) this is exactly what we had planned. So Mm -hmm. you just talked about an experience that I think a lot of people that have a vision of what they want are very clear on what they want. Not everybody is. I think people struggle sometimes with being very clear on what they want. Yeah. But you are like, this is going to happen any cost. What is that like to set your sight on something and say, this is going to happen at any cost. We're going to flip a house. We're going to, you know, you know, 
run around the world. We're going to do whatever it takes to make this yeah. happen. What was, what was that feeling like? You know, a lot of people thought you were crazy. And I think a lot of people kind of either didn't think it was going to happen or didn't believe in it enough, or, you know, nobody's going to believe in what you want to do as much as you will. I had to really figure out what, first of all, I had to figure out that the, the people I was surrounding myself with were people who were actually going to challenge me to be better, not people who were going to hold me back. And did you have people in your life that were not doing that? We did. Yeah. We had some people in our lives that we just kind of said, you know, this isn't, this isn't serving us. This friendship is wonderful and we're so grateful for them, but it's a friendship that should be from afar. You know, I, I think some people get really stuck and they, they, they want other people to feel the same misery loves company. So we really, um, tried hard to protect our energy and to protect what it is that we were dreaming and doing so that when the time came, we could actually make that leap confidently. How did you do that? Oh my gosh. How do you do that? You Sometimes have, I yeah. look at it and I'm like, I have no clue. <laughs> yeah. Was it part of, part of the, the vision of what you guys wanted? It was so strong. The pull was so strong and you kind of hear this, man, man, man. You're like, Nah, you say it right back, you know? Right. I also yeah. think it's how I was raised. So my yeah. parents are, they were both entrepreneurs. So because of that, I was raised with the, you work hard and, and, um, you, you don't get a good job. You work hard and then you work harder and you work harder. Or my favorite was how, you know, you have a nine to five, but the five to nine is really where your life can, you know, change. So we worked really, really hard from day one and just put in our time and were able to make what we really wanted happen. Let's talk a little bit more about childhood or in, in that parent child yeah. relationship. I mean, so you hear entrepreneurs or business owners on this spectrum of like, my parents weren't there or they told me that I was stupid for not wanting to just go get a job or which is there's nothing wrong with that. But mm -hmm. also then you have on the other side, which our parents sound like they were similar, like, look, you do it. If you if you find something that makes you happy, you're going to be successful at it no matter what. Obviously, it takes hard work. But what was what was that relationship like for you as a kid, like fostering that growth and that? Just try, just give it a shot. You know, I, I think I got really lucky. I got lucky with my parents anyway. I got really lucky. Um, but my, my dad had a really, really great job and he worked for national frozen, frozen foods in Skagit County and national decided that they wanted to up and move elsewhere because it was going to be cheaper. So when they left, we either had to relocate as a family or my dad was going to have to give up his job and figure something out. So he decided to become a contractor. <laughs> So, wow. yeah, so he left a career of 25 years and turned around and opened a business as a contractor. And my mom is a stylist. She's been at the same salon in the same booth for 40 years. She's holding it down. Yeah, it's so rare to hear in with stylists, especially these days. You know, they both they both knew what it took to build a business. And I watched them build something. And, you know, I, I made my first money by sweeping my dad's job sites. Right. And sometimes I turned around and I had babysitting jobs that were before school in order to actually make any money. And I did 4-H and my parents really, really pushed. They didn't push. They kind of guided me in directions mm -hmm. that were going to keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, they got me a horse when I was 10 and it was kind of all, it was all uphill or it was all downhill from there. They, where'd you keep the horse? My, my horse actually lived at my grandparents' house. Okay. So mm -hmm. this wasn't the, the cul-de-sac horse or the, no, you know. <laughs> no, actually I thought it was so cool though. Cause every once in a while we would bring the horse into town and I would go ride, you know, we lived in La Conner. La Conner's really mm -hmm. small. And so uh, the house that we had, I would just ride down the the street and then go out into the the fields. But I definitely live, you know, I grew up in town. It wasn't your typical childhood where my parents encouraged me to go to college, get a good job and work there for 40 years. It was a childhood of learning how to adapt mm -hmm. and grow and change and, and do what you really like. Yeah, we have this like this new form of intelligence that people well, it's always been there but it's one of, it's like the new analysis around adaptive intelligence mm -hmm. and you know you got the emotional intelligence the, the iq the, tell me a little bit more about that whole concept of like adapting how yeah. important is that well for you throughout your childhood and into being an entrepreneur and a business owner and a parent if anything the pandemic kind of pandemic pandam <laughs> pandam <laughs> if anything the pandemic it it really kind of showed how important it is to be adaptive and to be, you know, to be willing to change your business model in the first place. This is not the first business I had built, mm -hmm. but it was the first one where I had this crystal clear vision of what was, what it was going to be like and what I really wanted out of things. I went to college. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I got three years into college and I realized what I was doing was not what I wanted to do with the rest of my life and kind of changed courses and, 
took a few extra years. <laughs> You're smarter than I am because oh. it took me five years to realize. That. Oh so my gosh. You figured it out quicker than I did. And yeah. <laughs> All those student loans. And I'm like, oh, those are classes that were terrible. But I, I really think, you know, I, I figured I never saw myself. Well, how do I say this? Some people are, are like, how do you describe that? How do you, um, how did that work for you? I didn't know any different. So for me, owning my own business and owning my own time, I, I laugh that maybe I was allergic to the nine to five. I don't know. But I loved controlling when and where I was working and what I was doing. And I had, there was never a time where I didn't believe it could happen. So, I mean, there was times where you were like, what am I doing? But there was never times where I was like, oh, I can't do this. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And this whole concept of trading time, which I, I think it's really important, like trading time for education, um, trading time for money to a certain degree, because there's like a certain core element of like a business owner, what provides the, you know, the meat and potatoes on the table, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's this other, like the creative side of it. And then, you know what, today I don't have to, like, this is running fine. I can go do this. What was that like transitioning? And we'll dive back into the full story. But what was this like transitioning from like, I have to show up every day because I have to put food on the table to being like, food's on the table. And now we can get a little creative with it. You know, we were really smart and my husband kept his full-time job and he was able to really provide for the bills and the things that we had to do, you know, our mortgage, stuff like that. And then we turned around and we took every last dollar we had and we invested it into actually growing a farm mm. because what we bought was raw land. We didn't yeah. have, you know, it had, I shouldn't say that it had a house. The house was in terrible shape. So it had to be gutted and remodeled. But you'd flip so, the house. So you saw it and you're like, woohoo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I remember when we walked in, Ryan was like, oh my gosh, I know you're going to want to change all of this. Yeah. So we lived in a 1985 20 foot travel trailer outside nice. with two little kids. And I was very pregnant. And, and we just knew that if we were going to do this, we couldn't afford to buy something turnkey and ready to go. We were going to have to put in some major work slowly over time. We just started from, I mean, literally from scratch. The place was in really bad shape. What was and, an example of like the thing you saw? You, you'd flipped a house and yeah. you'd seen things that like you'd done before. And then what was the, were there some things in there that you looked at and went, oh, that's going to be a real pain to, to get, get to where I want it to be. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, we had to gut everything. So when I, like we literally stood on the sand on the ground and could see through the second story rafters because it was in such bad shape. You're not, you're not supposed to be able to see through those. No, no. I mean, I mean, we literally like we had gutted everything. There was, um, there was no oven. It was a wood burning oven with a chimney that had to be capped in order for us to even get lending. So like the chimney had to come out, like yeah. there was some major things we had to do just to get the house livable. And then we had to turn around and figure out, okay, now the house is livable. What's next? You know, what, what things. And then we started building fence. So it was house. So you could live there, then fence. And so I'm sure you could talk for days about how you get a farm prepared. Mm. Tell me for someone like me that has very little knowledge on farming, how do you, how do you like start a farm? How, what, like, what's the first thing you do? Right. You know, <laughs> I wish I could say <laughs> like X, Y, Z for us, we wanted to raise livestock. You know, we didn't want to be crop farmers. We had no desire to do crop farming. We wanted to raise livestock and the top, the, the um, topography of the place that we bought allowed, it was going to allow us to do that because it's not, you know, 30 acres are wooded. Mm -hmm. So, so we had to kind of figure out what our goals were and then figure out how to make those things happen. And so for Ryan's dream in life had always been to raise cattle. Like he, that's just what he wanted. It was going to be really hard to do that with no fence. It yeah. was like, yeah. there was They'll little, They'll go to the right? They'll be the neighbors by tomorrow. Right? Yeah. There was little yeah. things that we had to chip away at to make happen. Ironically, the very first thing I ever brought home was a family dairy cow. All right. So, yeah. So we built a fence and then brought home a family dairy cow. And then slowly over time started kind of bringing home the livestock we really wanted. Ryan brought home some, some hogs to try raising hogs. We started raising meat chickens, which was a big. What is the difference between a meat chicken and an egg chicken? Is yeah, that there are. There's see, a big I'm difference. Super educated on yeah, that. chickens that lay eggs are a completely different breed. They don't produce very much meat. They don't. Mm -hmm. They don't. They just don't. It's like a marathon runner. They just aren't. They just, they just don't feel like it. No, they, they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. Meat chickens are have been bred genetically to just grow larger amounts of meat. So I have kind of a dumb question for you, and I'm just very. And I was laughing about this with Tiffany, but I'm really fascinated with. The fact that chickens just hatch eggs like every day. They just mm -hmm. drop eggs every yep. day. What, how, how? Yeah, the food. They just food. eat food. They eat food and then they produce eggs. It's, there's no rooster required. There's no forcing it. There's no nothing. It just happens. And then we can eat them. Yep. But if a rooster gets in the picture, when a, when a rooster yeah. loves a chicken. Yeah. Then Which that's they when, do. yeah, when they, they, I'm sure they do. 
but how so that is the that is the clear line in the sand of like when they would become a chicken like they would no they actually have to sit on the egg and most of the what most people don't actually realize is that chickens don't want to sit on their eggs all year round and some breeds won't sit on on them ever so they'll lay an egg and walk away how dare they right i know they definitely abandon their children yeah (laughs) (laughs) but then an egg has to be incubated for it to actually ever hatch a chick Mm -hmm. so we do have roosters so our eggs sometimes are fertilized but there's nothing there's nothing different than what you'd get at the grocery store understood Mm -hmm. thank you for clarifying that so okay so you're you're building this, this farm from scratch you're looking at the topography and you're going, okay, this could be where we'll put the cattle. This could be where we, like you, you had this vision. Was it written down? Did you just have it in your heads? Like how, how are you picturing this 120 acres? Oh my gosh. It was, it was wild. So what I will say though, is the first thing that we did was we had a soil scientist to come out and they looked at our ground and, and we really wanted to know how well we could grow grass and what we needed to do to improve those pastures. They gave us some kind of tips and tricks and we realized it was going to cost us so much money to make those pastures healthy that we couldn't afford to do it. That's when we just started, I mean, literally like YouTube farming. We started Googling, we started reading textbooks, we started doing everything we could to figure out how can we bring the health of our our ground back because it was dead. Mm. I mean, it was dead. What's dead Um, ground? No microbes in the soil. Um, there was no bugs. You mm. dig dig a hole and sometimes you'll get worms. There was no worms. There was no bugs. There was no microbes. It was dead. It wouldn't grow grass very well. The soil itself was just so depleted of nutrition that plant life couldn't even grow. So the first thing that we did was we had to fix that. So we actually, that's why we started raising meat chickens. Mm. They they have extremely healthy so, or, uh, uh, manure. They laid a thick layer of manure and then we'd move them through our pastures. So we were rebuilding our soil while create like literally producing this pastured healthy meat for our customers. Mm-hmm. Wow. And that was where we kind of started. That's and it seems like your business model, and we'll dive more into it. Yeah. Has like all of these layers and like it's very self-sustaining. Mm-hmm. Like there's one thing aids to another thing, which aids to another thing. But it doesn't yeah. seem like, you know, when I was looking through everything, it doesn't seem like it's like unmanageable. It seems like it's doable, but it also I'm just very fascinated with this mechanism, this this machine mm-hmm. that you've created that's so powerful, yet it's right here in Whatcom County, right. which is awesome. Right. Our focus was on regenerative agriculture. We wanted to make sure that our ground was left better than it was when we arrived. So we had to figure out what ways can we work together? What ways can all of our livestock work together too? And then as a business, we, had to, we knew we had to diversify. We couldn't only raise chicken. If we were only going to raise chicken, our entire income would be stuck in just those months that you can raise chicken because mm. you can't raise chicken in nasty weather. Hmm. They just, they can't handle the cold. We had to figure out, you know, what other things can we bring in to help our income in the first place? And what other things can we bring in that are going to work symbiotically with our livestock and with our ground? So layer, like seasonal layers, but then also the layers of each season working like when one season ends the next one's just ready to go yeah 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 it's pretty wild because you know ryan and i joke that i feel like farming is saying you know when this season's over i'll have time till you die yeah <laughs> <laughs> like this is basically yeah. when one season ends another season kind of picks up and then we start all over again and it's just this big cycle it's been a lot of learning mm. and figuring those cycles out but like in this case right now we have a large group of feeder hogs what they're called um out in our woods that are turning over non-native blackberries so they're helping get rid of the blackberries in the off season when the blackberries aren't growing but literally your our ground has um a seed bank in it that is extremely old and that seed bank anytime this the ground is disrupted the seeds can come to the surface again mm. and so what's happening is they're out there digging up all these non-native blackberries getting rid of the roots and getting rid of the structure like the entire plant structure we have a hard time doing yeah humans, yeah yeah exactly yeah. and so pigs do a great job and they're out there doing that right now on on these these pastures that we rotate them through. So they're clearing ground that had just completely gone. It had been logged 10 years ago and then stripped. Stripped. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's it's there's a lot of native vegetation in there that we're trying to preserve, but there's a lot of non-native stuff that we're letting them do their work with. Going back to school, you went to school for regenerative farming and agriculture and soil composition, right? Oh my gosh, no. My first three years. Yeah. <laughs> my first three years, I was convinced I wanted to be, my first year, I thought I was going to be a neuroscientist. And then I turned around and and wanted to go to nursing school. And then about three years into it, I was like, I can't, I don't want to do this. Um, so I took animal science courses and eventually biochemistry is kind of what I landed on, mm. but it wasn't necessarily a choice. It was because that's what I had enough credits to finish with. So just your path led you there. And I didn't plan on really using it. I just wanted to be done with school. Mm. (laughs) I was done at that point. My husband actually had a heart attack when we were 24. Wow. It was, I know, kind of like total side note. But because of that, I think that my 
my view of what I had wanted to do previously completely shifted. And I just was like, I don't, a big yeah, I don't want to do this. This is not really what I had intended to set out to be or do. And so I kind of just slowly picked away and figured out what, what I was good at. It reshifted your priorities. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And a lot of it just kept coming back to livestock. And it just kind of kept circling back. Two things here. First thing, you have this priority shift and you go, eh, I'll probably make a lot of money doing that, but that's not the most important piece to this. I don't feel like mm -hmm. it's just got that like power pack. Like I could wake up every day yeah. and do this. And then you have Ryan's heart attack and that shifts your priorities going, mm, I want to do something that I can wake up together and do this, do something that makes me, that fills me with joy and, 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 and I'm engaged in every day. And it's just my passion, you know? Yeah transition into now and every day when you wake up, tell me a little bit about gratitude and having that as a business owner, you know, as a mother, as a mm -hmm. wife, all of the things into one, because this is really a mix of lifestyle and a business. You live it. Mm -hmm. You live your we business do. every day, but it's also your passion. What's yeah. that like for you? Um, It's actually really neat. <laughs> uh, that's how, the, the most cheesy thing to say, but it is waking up and putting your feet on the ground is supposed to be exciting. Mm. It's not meant to be mundane. And I firmly believe that we are our best selves when we're doing things that make us happy. And to pair a passion with a living is probably one of the biggest blessings and examples I can show for my kids. Mm. So I have three little kids that I, they are my favorite humans on the planet. And I actually really love spending time with my kids. Like I, I love having them home. I love homeschooling. I love just them being around and building a life with them has, has been, um, it's just really cool. <laughs> you know, Levi, my oldest son, he's eight and he's probably more well-versed in science than most adults are. And he's, he has the concept of, of, you know, the circle of life and also really understands that what it's like to nourish your body, not just eat to eat. So he's, he's, and he can grow. I mean, I'm pretty sure if something happened to my husband and I, my son could last weeks and no one would know because <laughs> he just, is so self-sufficient. Yeah. yeah. He's so self-sufficient. He's a great kid. He's a hard, hard worker. They all are actually. And they, but I think that's been an example that has been shown to them. Well, and it's, mm -hmm. it's something that you live and you, you show, right. You yeah. can, you can tell somebody, you can speak to somebody and tell them this is the way things are, but they look up to you, you both and, mm -hmm. and, and see you as an example of how to do life. Exactly. What are, what are some like core values that you live by? What are some things that drive you? Oh my goodness. My family is my number one. And I think it is for, uh, for a lot of people, obviously, but for us, we don't want necessarily our, how do I say this? We want our kids to know that they have a safe place to come home to no matter what. So we wanted to create a place for them that didn't feel like, Oh, I have to work or, uh, we have to, whatever. I wanted them to feel like home was home base. And so we've really fostered that. You know, another thing that I'm kind of a non-negotiable in our life is our food. I'm not willing to sacrifice quality for speed. You know, we, I spend a lot of time in the kitchen, um, which is partly why I want, like we desperately wanted to farm was we wanted to control another aspect of cooking. And so we've really instilled a lot of that in our kids that food should come from the earth. Food should should not necessarily come from a box and how to, how to make those things. It's a lot of time, mm -hmm. but it's also shifted that relationship between food and how it fuels your body. And also it's not normal to get a strawberry in the middle of January. Exactly. They're exactly. still there and they taste like strawberries. They might mm -hmm. be a little bit whiter than normal. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's something that my mom also is, she eats out of her garden in it. Seattle, I in the middle of it. Seattle, you know, there's this other aspect when it comes to health. So you've got the, from the earth supporting local, like sustainable, right. A yeah. sustainable food source. And then also there's the other part about health. I mean, there's like, when you grow it yourself, you control all aspects of how it's, how it's created mm -hmm. or how it grows. Tell me a little bit about your outlook on health. That's actually what started all of this was that, you know, we wanted to do um, when Ryan got sick, when he was younger, we kind of took that as a wake up call and just like, okay, we need to be a little bit better about our food sources. And at that point we were eating out a lot and we were just kind of, we're both working hard. So it was kind of convenience. Mm -hmm. So we really shifted to how, how we were eating. We tried to eat more seasonal. We tried to eat better for ourselves anyway. And then we took it a step further and said, we wanted to raise our own and, and really it all encompasses 
that exact notion that we just wanted to be healthier and it tastes better. Mm. <laughs> if you've ever had homemade bone broth, the taste and the flavor of that is next level in comparison to boxed stuff at the grocery store. And the health benefits are even 10 times more. So we really wanted to bring all that together. And it's been an, I always laugh, it's been an adventure, a lot of learning and a lot of learning curves and a lot of figuring things out and a lot of getting over some kind of misconceptions. And mm -hmm. farming industry is extremely nuanced. Mm -hmm. It's very deep and complex. And I had a lot of opinions about it before I started farming that have shifted and changed a lot too. What are some of those opinions? Oh man. Ooh. <laughs> we can that's, pause. We can that's pause a deep. Whew. Yeah. You know what? There's kind of this misconception. I don't want to say misconception. There's a lot of opinion pieces that have been seen as fact pieces on whether, you know, how much methane contribution livestock really does have. What people don't necessarily realize is, have you ever heard of carbon credits? Okay, so so farms like us qualify for carbon credits, and then large corporations can buy those carbon credits and then call themselves carbon neutral. Well, we're the ones creating the carbon sink. We're not the ones creating the methane. And so, Or little things like we feed our cattle kelp because kelp is a wonderful nutritional source. It's a great vitamin and mineral source. We feed that to cattle and it actually reduces their methane production. Interesting. Yeah. And you don't see that very A cattle uh, eating kelp? No. Yeah. yeah well, the, you just don't see it. That's not something that's talked about. Right. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of science and studies on it and we, we have to figure out how to feed the world and also kind of bridge the gap between the farm and the consumer. Cause that's what feels really broken. I would agree mm -hmm. on that. And there's also, we, we talk about that world being nuanced, the information piece. Yeah. How, how do you communicate with other people? You've clearly like, it's resonated with you. Oof. Tell me about like, <laughs> we meet on the street and I say, I want to start eating local, locally sourced food. And I, I just don't know what I don't know. How do you, how do you explain all of oh. this to me? What, oh, would you like to come to dinner? <laughs> it yes. would take a long time. Is that a formal invitation <laughs> yes. to one of your, one of your dinners? I love Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I love it. Yes. There's so much complexity and depth to it. And, and one thing that's been forgotten is that, you know, a hundred years ago, a huge portion of people's income went to just feeding themselves. Mm. And now we have cut that down to an, ex I mean, people are budgeting very little in comparison to their income because they have all these other things we're budgeting for now, but we have lost sight of the fact that food isn't, shouldn't be cheap. You know, one kind of quote I'll stick in there is that in order for it to be sustainable, it has to be profitable. Mm -hmm. So, and that's any business, right. but Farming especially cannot sustain, it, it can't sustain itself if it's not profitable. If it's not profitable enough to feed the family that's growing the food, something's wrong. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And 70% of chicken farmers in the United States are living below the poverty line. There's something wrong. There's something very broken. And yet we go to the store and we demand cheap food until people are willing to see that cheap food is produced cheaply and not necessarily sustainably. We have to start shifting and seeing food as fuel and seeing it as mm. an important piece of our budget. That's why we have spent so much time educating. That's why I started an Instagram in the first place was mm. I really wanted to connect people to the people producing their food. You know, I'm not the most well-versed person out there. I don't have an education in environmental sciences. If anything, I know where we can find the resources that are accurate. For many years, Ryan and I sat and watched Netflix documentaries or we would watch TV shows and stuff. Have you that... seen the one called Cowspiracy? I have. Oh, shocking. Ooh, shocking. Ooh, yeah. Ouch. Ouch. That's a brutal one. Yeah, that one is. And then you turn around and you have to say, okay, let's dissect the science of that. And it, does that really exist? And if I'm willing to watch Cowspiracy, am I also willing to watch Sacred Cow? Yeah. You know, there's, there's all these pieces and parts to the puzzle that people have forgotten that you, you know, we can't make our soil better unless we have compost to put on that soil. And that compost is, it comes from livestock. Mm -hmm. 10, 15, 20 years ago, there wasn't the same audience or ability to reach an audience mm -hmm. or educate or be educated from the internet. Mm -hmm. So you stepped into this in a really unique time. And I think there's a huge opportunity that's missed by people that have some sort of like just masterful expertise yes. on something and they're not on social media using it for positive yeah, or educating, right? Yeah. You've grown this amazing following just by doing the things you do every day. You know, you've been, you're educating yourself, but you're just doing the things you're doing every day and you're having fun with it. And that connects people to you from a business perspective, it's the difference between someone buying from a bigger, you know, farm or another farm. It's what connects you, the food and the people 
Yeah. Tell me about that experience into getting into social media. Social media is a beast. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> it is a beast. You know, I had to figure out where am I going to designate my time? The, the yeah. first thing I had to look at, my husband is extremely talented. He has a lot of skills and a lot of assets. And then my job was to turn around and say, okay, he produced the food. My job is to sell it. Mm -hmm. And so I had to figure out how best am I going to do that with three small children? Mm -hmm. I couldn't do farmer's markets. Mm -hmm. It's Why? not, it's not something I just don't have the time yeah. between the setting up for the farmer's market, doing the farmer's market. Market, breaking it down and getting all of that meat back into the freezers, it was going to take me three days for a one day sales. So instead of going to a farmer's market, I thought to myself, how can I bring the farmer's market to me? Mm. How can I, and, and that's where e-commerce came into, into kind of play. Then we turned around and, and decided to open up a store on the farm where people can come and purchase their meats. So that opened up a whole nother door where I was figuring out how to create a niche for ourselves that our lifestyle could fit into mm. because I was not going to fit into, I just can't do farmer's markets with a two-year-old. Family is one of your core values. And that yes. was part of the, it had to fit around that. And were there other people that were in the same world? Were, were they saying, ah, oh, I'm not going to do the farmer's market. It has to come to me. You know, we were really lucky. We had some mentors that were kind of played a key role in it that are, are farmers who are also shipping meats and, and had started before we did and were willing to help us along the way. And that was instrumental. Direct to consumer, we knew was going to be the only way that we could make a sustainable profit. The livestock industry is extremely nuanced. There is a lot of pieces and parts and moving parts. And, you know, the price that you see in the grocery store is not the price the farmer got for the meat that they sold. Right. We had to figure out how best are we going to actually make margins that are going to allow us to continue to farm or right. allow us to grow. Right. And direct to consumer was the only way that we could make that happen. The hardest part is that we can have a whole bunch of local farmers. We could have farmers, you know, every single farmer in Washington state could turn around and say, I'm only going to sell direct to consumer. And it would shake the system. There is not enough processors to handle that. So that's an, that's like there's this bottleneck where we had to work extremely hard to find processors that would allow us to legally sell our meat the way we do. So we have to travel sometimes 12 hours to get to a processor with our livestock that is going to turn around and give us a meat that we can actually sell. Let's so a processor being like a butcher? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So any meat that we sell is USDA inspected. So it's it's been processed with that inspection. And because of that, it's the only way to legally sell a pork chop to you. Hmm. So yeah, in, in Washington, it's also the only way that we could sell meat across state lines. Interesting. So okay. yeah. And there's a lack of processors. Huge lack. Why are, Huge what's lack. happening in that world? Why are, why are there not more butchers? Oof. More people don't like to chop Oof. meat up? Well, that's where price came in came yeah. into play. So in, in the nineties and even early two thousands, people really wanted to shop at Walmart for their stuff because it was cheaper. So all of those small butchers went by the wayside. So now we've realized we've centralized our food system and that started crumbling. And now we really need these processors again. And it's so expensive to start them up that there's a vacuum and there's a very, there's a major bottleneck. Shout mm -hmm. out to all the people thinking about being butchers out <laughs> right? there. There's <laughs> right? a big opportunity. You are needed. You, you are needed. needed. Be a yes. butcher. Be yes. A butcher. Yes. Hey everyone, it's Tiffany, the producer behind the show. One of our goals here at the show is to uplift awesome small businesses in our community. So every month, our team produces a local business news update where we celebrate anniversaries, announce changes and collaborations, or tell you about major business moves so you can stay in the know. It's all on social media, so be sure to follow the Building Bellingham podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Social media, as you said, is a beast. You, It takes momentum yes. and it takes consistency and it takes quality content and it takes knowledge and something that people can connect to. And time. And time. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's, I know. We time. joke around the office that um, anytime we have something like like the podcast or anything that I, I joke with Tiffany, like, but this isn't a full-time job. This You can you could probably tack this on with like five other things, right? That's uh -huh. like the, the theme in the real estate world. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. So how did you identify social media as one of your ways to connect with people? I didn't really have an option. Okay. No, <laughs> um, yeah. It was either I was going to, you know, we started a blog. I started a super basic non, it's not monetized or anything like that. I just started a blog so I could tell my story and gain SEO. I turned around and I said, okay, but how am I going to connect with that generation that I'm those foodies that I want to connect with? And I saw that, the, you know, they're, they're watching Instagram. They're yeah. on Facebook, not as much on Facebook as much as they are on Instagram and a lot of those platforms. I kind of dabbled into TikTok and I realized I really wanted to focus on my what I was good at and what I was good mm. at was Instagram. I kind of I just honed in on that and then figured out first of all I just want to tell our story. Mm -hmm. I want to do it in a way that shares our story shares the positivity behind it because people don't necessarily want to see some aspects of what we do. They really want to see the feel good stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I figured out how 
to share that story and how to connect with those people. And it has created some extremely loyal customers that we're so grateful for. This, and this is also a completely, it's an interesting thing to buy a product on the internet without testing it. I'm, I'm weird right. about that. I'll give it a shot, but there's like a price like threshold, right? Uh -huh. Of mm, not going to, I can't, I can't do 200 bucks mm -hmm. or whatever the number is for people. And it's different for everybody. So how did like, have you gotten feedback from people on like, we just went, went for one of your subscription boxes and we took a chance on it and it was great. Or was the message from your social media so good that they were like, we know this is going to be good and we'd be shocked if it wasn't? You know, a lot of it was education. We knew from day one that if we were going to produce a product and make a sustainable income on it, we had to produce something that was different than what you'd go to the grocery store for. So when you come and get pork from us, it doesn't look like pork from the grocery store. It is the quality is exceptional. It just looks different. It's pinker. It's it's more red. So it's just note for everybody that's listening. <laughs> meat is supposed to be pink, not gray. Right. right. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, our beef was premium beyond the best of the best that you could find in a grocery store is what you were going to get from us. We also have a dry age process, which is where our meat hangs for 60, a minimum of 16 days, dry aging mm -hmm. um, versus a wet aging that you get at the grocery store. So there was all these pieces and parts that we needed to make different. We also raise a breed of chickens that is produces more of a yellow fat. And so the, the meat itself is healthier because the fat has more beta carotene in it. Yeah. So we had to figure out how to kind of niche ourselves into really appealing to people who valued quality over quantity and people who really actually wanted to invest in their food budget. And we found those people and we have really fostered an entire business catering to them. You found people through them, you educated them, you connected with your story. Yep. They got their first box or their first delivery and were like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. We ruined different. them for, yeah, <laughs> yeah we yeah, ruined them. them. Yep. Them hooked. yep. There was a, there was a, a bar set for what to expect and, and you're educating people on the health side of it and you're educating people on who's making it and your Instagram starts to grow. It did. It grew fast. How fast? <laughs> Very quickly. I learned how to tell my story over the course of the last two years. And then I think it was probably 2021 that I really honed in on that niche of who I needed to be speaking to. It, I believe it was about January 2021. And then our Instagram really just started taking off. So we gained kind of like your micro influencer status at that point. And it was enough that Instagram's great. You can tell a story all day long, but your conversion is what's really important. Mm -hmm. And so we had to figure out, we're going to tell our story, but how are we also going to connect with those people enough to sell to them? Right. And that's where I really started sharing stories. People don't just get a good post from us. They also get to see the the behind the scenes in the stories. And then we also started a um, farm club. What's and a farm club? So our farm club is, we have, a, we have a digital farm club and we have a meat box farm club. And it's a subscription program where people can order meats every 30, 60, or 90 days. And it's a rancher's box is what we call it. It's curated by us with their preferences, or they can do a digital farm club. And that's where they get to see the behind the scenes and the stories from us on one day a week that we reserve completely for them. So one day a week, they get exclusive content where we're sharing recipes, tips, tricks, veterinary care, a little bit more in depth than what kind of a regular day-to-day -day person would want to see when they're scrolling. Um, but we really wanted to connect people a little bit deeper. And so we, we, we rolled out Farm Club. So is it just you and your husband and your kids? Yeah. You know, we're really grateful. We do have, we do have a farm hand that comes once a week and helps us. And then we also do have a gal that we help to do shipping because shipping is, shipping is a whole nother beast. Yeah. <laughs> and for us, you know, shipping is one thing. Shipping perishables is another. We had mm -hmm. to figure out how the heck to package it, how to, you know, where to source dry ice, where to source liners, how to package our, our products so that it arrives anywhere in the country frozen still. So you deliver anywhere in the country? We do. This is a little bit from ancillary education. But if you go outside of a certain region, shipping starts to get more expensive. Right? It does. And it gets more mm -hmm. and more and more. Mm -hmm. But it's all domestic. You're, all, you're shipping all, only in the United States. Yes. Are you shipping to Canada, Mexico? They no. can't have any. Can't have any. That's right. Cut off. They have to come down here <laughs> to get some of <laughs> yes, it. Yes, they do. So, okay. So it gets more and more expen expensive as mm -hmm. you go out and out. Yeah. That's one part of the business. Yes. And some of those people find you through Instagram, word of mouth, et cetera. Outside of Instagram, how are people finding you locally and just in general? Word of mouth has been wildfire. We've been really lucky. You know, we've had so many people that stop by the ranch store and just say, oh, my friend told me I needed to come see you. We have pretty limited hours. What are your which, hours? Oh my gosh. Right now our hours are Saturdays from 10 to 2. That's all we have availability for. Is it pretty packed so on Saturdays? It is packed. 
it is packed. At this point, we're kind of at the, do we open up additional hours or do we just enlarge parking space? You know, how do we make this work? But for us, we had to do that because at some point we have to farm. Mm -hmm. So I can't spend all day at a ranch store if I also have to turn around and farm. So someone has to feed and care for the livestock. So we try to divide and conquer, but we, we designate those hours specifically so people can come in and we want them to see us. We didn't want them to see some random person that was working in the store. We wanted them to see us and connect with us. So we've tried our best to increase those hours, but right now that's what we're sitting at. So then if that doesn't work for people, we always, we can ship to their door too. Are you a calendar person? Do you follow a calendar or do you just, you follow, is there a calendar just moving in your head? Like what? I am terrible. How, how do you show up? <laughs> to a certain place at a certain time. I do have a calendar. I have a, I am a, and I like handwritten stuff. Okay. I have an actual physical planner. The hardest part about farming is I could write it in my planner, but it's probably not going to work out that way. Yeah. Like for us, <laughs> I would love to have, you know, you, you we have to kind of work backwards. So like, if I'm going to have bacon for you, I know that bacon is going to take 30 days to cure, cure, but to brine and to smoke. And then prior to that, I'm going to have to make sure that my animal hits the size I need them to hit at a certain time period. So I'm gonna have to work backwards from that. And I'm going to hope that that mama is bread. So things don't always work out the way I want. Sometimes that mama doesn't get bread. And so I'm not going to have bacon for another month out. Mm -hmm. So we have to be extremely flexible, mm -hmm. but we also have to work extremely hard when we can, because sometimes we just have to cash in. On it's just it. a window. It's a window of opportunity and you have to run. And sometimes you run all day long. On a seasonality, there's, there's a calendar of seasonality yeah. with food and, and the different products that are done at different times of the year, just purely based mm -hmm. on yeah. Weather, right? And crops more so than livestock, but yeah. yeah. How do you operate on that? And then there's also a spectrum within that. Like, let's say there's a, a weather event that happens that doesn't right. normally happen. Like how, like, how do you adapt to that? It's been hard. You know, I am someone who, who likes control and I like to feel in control. And when there's so many outside forces, it can feel a little out of control. The, the part about farming that I think really gets people hung up is that you can't go exactly by you know, a schedule. You're going to work your butt off all the time. And sometimes you're going to fail and sometimes you're going to learn and, but you just get up and you keep going. So weather is a huge problem for us. You know, our, our last year's drought, it took a little bit more time and effort on those days. You know, you can't go inside and sit in the air conditioning. We had to go out and we had to make sure that everyone was well taken care of day in and day out. You know, the snow hits, the, the ice hits, and we spend more time outside than we did in the summertime just to keep livestock fed and watered. You know, there is seasonality to it, but with livestock, not as much as, as crop farming. Just their reliance on the food that mm -hmm. resources the resources yep. right right in the grazing season we're moving livestock we don't ever really have downtime because in the grazing season we're moving livestock every 24 hours i mean we're we're out there moving them to a different spot in the off season we're out there feeding them yeah. <laughs> so the, it really doesn't slow down necessarily you know we're we're in what's called our farrowing season right now so our hogs are having babies and so we'll have lots of babies on the ground and then that seasonal end and then next month i start lambing so my sheep will all start having babies within 2 months about a month and a half how many and then what's um, What's typical? Um, right now, we should probably have about 75 babies on the ground. 75 yeah. lambs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. I know when I say that out loud, I'm like, ooh. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> so we'll have quite a, an influx of sheep and then we'll um, work with them all sim summer long and graze them through. And then they go away in the fall. And then we start another season. You know, we Then we start farrowing again in the fall because we farrow twice a year. So there's a lot of moving pieces and parts in farming that being as diversified as we are, as fast as we did, was a painful learning curve. Yes, there was a lot of failure. There was a lot of question asking. There was a lot of seeking information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And being open to it. And being open to change. And, you know, you can ask 10, far 10 farmers for their opinion. You're going to get 11 opinions. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's right. kind of, I feel like it's the same way in almost every industry. <laughs> Everyone has a little bit of a different way of doing things. So we wanted, you know, we don't have an organic label on our stuff because we believe in being beyond organic. Mm -hmm. But we still wanted to make sure that we were doing things in a way that was going to be sustainable and something that was going to last long term and that we weren't kind of shifting gears in two months. So we asked a lot of farmers for information. There's this graph. And on it is on one axis. I don't know which one's which because I failed math. No, I'm just kidding. I love it. Uh, on one axis is quantity and one axis is quality. Like and you, there's this perfect balance for everybody else. Yep. Everybody, right? Yeah. And there's there's no one right way of doing it. There's what works for you as the business center. So you get to a level of quality and you go, this is great. We love this. I, we could do more. And then you layer on something else that allows you to do that. Mm -hmm. Tell me about this like layering process, because there's a lot of layers to your business. Like what did it's you start with? Diverse. What was, what was the kind of like process and the, the layers of, of dirt, if you will, that you added on top 
to get to the point where you're at with all of these different facets of your business? Yeah. Our original intentions have also shifted from, from three or four years ago. You know, we started raising chicken. We started raising a, a little bit of lamb and pork, and then we slowly added cattle in because cattle, first of all, the infrastructure from it of it is extremely expensive. So we kind of just started adding things. And then we added an educational piece into it because we were selling our knowledge that we could turn around and help fund a lot of those things that mm. we were we were wanting to grow with. That was also a big piece is we never wanted to sacrifice quality for quantity. Mm -hmm. You know, we knew how much we could make when we would break down an animal and, and sell the meat. But we wanted to make sure that we were always selling the quality you could guarantee. Mm -hmm. So that also, it took scalable infrastructure from mm -hmm. day one. You know, we had to make sure what we were doing was something we could scale and never lose quality too. There's been some fine lines where we've sat and we've said, okay, this is as much as we can do right now, because if we add anything more to that, we're going to run ourselves too thin and then we can't devote the time we need to, to each one of these species. Mm -hmm. It's a big one. Mm -hmm. Well, and then there's this other piece that's demand mm -hmm. and it's like, you're trying to stay on track with your vision and like what the right time to layer. But then you've got this like this window on a Saturday where there's uh, people are lined up at the door to yeah. buy your product. Mm -hmm. How do you look at that line and go, God, I want to give every single one of them exactly what they want yeah. and realize that you may not be able to, if that means that you would sacrifice the quality, right. what's that balance like for you? That's, it's been a hard one because I'm a people pleaser a big difficult one. You know, we, that's why we started farm club. We had to make sure that, that we had a certain core of people that we could guarantee the best of the best to. And then we would allow anyone else to purchase what was left over basically, but yeah. the leftover is still really good. Yeah. So we've had, we kind of had to find the balance of what was going to work best in our business where we could ensure that the, the quality we were, was never sacrificed. And that's been hard. That's been really hard. The other thing too, is that we never wanted meat to sit in the freezers for very long. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to be able to say it was fresh. Mm -hmm. it, is there a timeline on that, by the way? Like that you can, like that someone would go, uh. USDA says that by the, the date on the label should be no longer than a year, but our goal is a month. Okay. So we want something in your hands within a month of having processed it. So we aim for that because we want to make sure the quality is there. I'd rather it sit in your freezer than sit in mine. You know, we've never slowed down on our marketing because we really wanted to make sure that the demand was there to meet the increase of production. That's been a huge learning curve, especially because our background is not in business. So we've had, you know, we, we started out with the amount we were charging in day year one is significantly different than, than year three, because we learned a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was a layer the, 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 the farm club, you added that in as a layer to ensure that like the people that had stuck with you and love the, love the brand and were loyal, that were very loyal. Yeah. That they were, you're making sure that they got their core. Yes. And then you have the people that straggle in on a Saturday and go, what's this line about? And you're like, right. huh. Just, just, you can go to the end, but I'll come say hi to you. Um, but okay, so you've added that layer in. Yeah. You have the educational layer, which is, you know, it's intellectual property. Yep. Right. So you can you can make income off of that, but it's also educating the people that you're connecting with. Exactly. And there's a collaborative element to this. Like, and it seems like within your world, like what you've explained to me, that there's a lot of ranchers that are like, hey, I'll show you what I do. No problem. Yeah. Now let's talk about these dinners. Yeah. Where do they come from? So that was, collaborating. I know. It's another collaboration. Oh man. That was a vision I had from day one. When we talked about wanting to have a farm, I was like, I want to do my goal in all of this has been to con connect the consumer to the, the producer. I've always loved bridging that gap. My husband is an introvert. He could be home and never talk to another soul and be a okay with that. So the dinners were my way of bringing people to us. And it was also okay with Ryan. Cause I fed him. <laughs> does he, does he sit at the table too? He does. He's like, he does. Our whole family yeah, does. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So we advertise it as a date night. <laughs> our kids are there because they're our kids and they're part of our farm. Mm -hmm. But our farm to table dinners are are something that we hold really close. So we work with a private chef who comes in and we do a four course meal and it is um, hors d'oeuvres are served while people are mingling throughout the ranch. So they can go see livestock. They can go see the gardens. They can go see the orchard. The dinners are set up in the orchard. So it's a long table dinner. Everything that um, the meat is all raised by us as many of the veggies as we possibly can, we source from us. And then everything else is, was, was sourced within a few miles. So from the garlic to the oils, to the, to the butter, I churned the butter and made the butter for, for the dinners to everything we possibly can. We wanted it to be a next level experience and it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. Pictures. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So we've worked really hard to curate a following that falls in love with the people who are raising the food in the first place. Because I don't know if you've ever sat down to a steak that someone you know has raised, but you treat that steak differently. You, you know, you value the food on your plate differently. Food waste is a huge producer of greenhouse gases. You would waste so much less food if you knew exactly who raised it and how much time that took. Coming from a place of I've eaten really good steaks yeah, and pork chops, but I, I've never had that experience before. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm very curious and I, and I love hearing about that. So you have this collaboration, yeah. people show up. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the first one. I had this vision of what it was going to look like and I had cut out, this is how nerdy I am, but I had like cut out all of these pictures out of magazines of what I wanted these dinners to look like and feel like. And I put them on a poster board and we tried to recreate exactly what that feeling would be when you walked in. So when, when you drive up to the ranch, you park and you get out and immediately you're greeted by by someone who gives you a map and the map has um it tells you where all the livestock are and where they are currently at the moment because our livestock moves all the time so we want you to know that you can't see the sheep right now because they're grazing in the woods or that our hogs right now are are back on this piece and and we'll go visit them or what where on the farm the chickens are at the time then you're also greeted by our hors d'oeuvres so we have staff that that wander around and they're serving hors d'oeuvres and drinks so you can mingle at the, on the ranch and be able to see see things. And then when dinner comes, we sit down for our meals. And typically we try to bring in a, a meat cut that you wouldn't necessarily be as familiar with that is going to be next level. Mm. So yeah. So um, one of our dinners, we did an apple or a, an apple brined um, bone in pork loin. Oh so yeah, it was, so what's <laughs> typically a pork chop, but we showed them how good it can actually be when not only is it cooked well, but it's raised well. So we, we did this entire huge spread. It was beautiful. We did rabbit profiteroles, which is um, kind of like a cream puff type pastry with rabbit ground rabbit it was just wonderful we did lamb with uh, tzatziki sauce that we actually made on the farm with raw milk from the farm it's a celebration but it's a really it's the ultimate date night yeah when my wife listens to this <laughs> any chance i can get us on the list we'll be on the list <laughs> we'll stick you on the list yes yeah. okay so there's a there's kind of an interesting element around gathering and like getting to know the people that are involved yes so you made it made this call and i've seen pictures mm -hmm. on your instagram yeah. on the instagram the grand that are like a long it's a long table yeah and everyone's at one table and yep. they may not know each other why did you choose to do that over like separating people into their own little like bubbles where they can hide on their phones and right right things, because you know? i'm a bubbler i'm yeah. i like my i like i was the, i was the person in college where like before i could afford an ipod where i had the headphones in my ear and like just Fake. in the pocket Yes, yes, because I just didn't want to talk to people. And I was yeah. super, not antisocial, but We've just really socially awkward. You're not alone. To so, walk through campus. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I wanted to foster community. One of the coolest things we've seen happen is people will sit down with a stranger next to them they've never met and they'll leave with having exchanged phone numbers or at least following each other on social media. We've created kind of this community. And then the really neat thing is, is those people then see each other again every time we host something. So they they tend to be really return customers. We have some that come almost every single week and they've been at our dinners and they're part of our farm club. And so we've created this niche of people that we love through dinners, through educational class. I mean, we do a bread making class. We do butchery classes. We do a lot of different educational parts of this and we've created a community that just has gotten to know each other and that's what business is, is really about it's yes. about community right it's not it's it's in, dissected into two different types of community it's the community that surrounds you yeah. but it's also people that have like-minded mm -hmm. wants and needs and your wants and needs are for high quality local and also the education yeah. behind and getting to know the whole process and and really being connected to it so yeah for for somebody that's starting a business and they're like uh, I don't really want to do the social media thing or I don't want to do events. They don't make money or whatever the thing is. I don't know what it is, but you've like, you've have all these facets and you find value in all of them. And it's not all about profit on each thing as a business owner. You, you have to be, you have to make money. Yes. But like yeah. each one of these things feeds into this web. Why is each one of these things important to you and why should it be important to others that are starting a business? Yeah. The farm table dinners has never been an income producer for us, but it's an extremely good marketing tool. Mm that we invested in knowing just how powerful it could be. 
we do a lot of things that don't necessarily bring us an income, but they bring us a following and they bring us connection mm. and having connected with people that deeply, they, they are not only return customers, but they're sharing us all the time. You know, they open a box of meats and they're sharing us on Instagram. They, you know, un unpack the bag of meat that they came to the ranch store and bought and they're sharing it. Oh, every time someone does that, it's free advertising and it really helps. When you think about, is this really worth the return on investment? You can't think about what's, you know, return on investment this month or next month. You have to think about what's it going to be in two years. Longevity. Yes. Yes. And in order for you to, to be sustainable, you have to start putting in the work, even when it doesn't feel like it's, it's got any value to it. That's, that's such a powerful message. Um, because I hear all the time, what's the ROI on that? I'm like, the, you can't quantify it sometimes. What's the return on the impact? Yeah, exactly. That's the big, bigger question, right? Yeah. I want to shift gears a little bit. Okay. And you are business partners with your husband. Yeah. And with your kids in a sense. That's an intense dynamic. Yeah. Tell me about it. You know, I am really lucky that I don't want to say lucky, but Ryan and I are best friends before anything else. So our marriage is very, very strong. And because of that, I think we can actually play on each other's strengths instead of pointing out each other's weaknesses. Ryan is really, he has some really tangible skills in he can weld, he can build, he can, you know, he can build. He's just extremely smart when it comes to the mechanical side of things. If something's broken, he can fix it. I cannot. So I don't pretend that I can do that. And so I stay in my wheelhouse. So when it comes to things like sales or us marketing ventures or, you know, things that we devote our time to, he is really trusting of me in knowing what's also going to be best for us. We work really well together in that we have been, we've played on each other's strengths instead of those weaknesses and still managed to have a partnership and still of uh how else do you say that <laughs> instead well, of a yeah it would be like so the, the friendship then there's the business yeah. partnership like it turning into this like transactional business partnership right because yeah. there is that element there has to, like in business there has to be this like right? you're good at this this is your strength you will do this we will put a budget towards this and then but then there's this other element to it there's yeah an emotional element right? and then there's parenthood, and there's parenthood <laughs> so, yeah. so then you're adding another additional facets to the whole dynamic of it, which is difficult. It's difficult, but it's also, it's a, it's a season, you know, we're in a short season where our kids are really young. Yep. So that seasonal end. And then what is next? We've worked really, really hard to make sure that we are still friends mm -hmm. at the end of every day and that we're still devoting time to our marriage too. Yeah. What does the word balance mean to you? Uh, it doesn't exist. Okay. <laughs> I was just curious. <laughs> I had to ask, but what do you like, because it's a lifestyle and a business is part of your rec time, essentially like your meditative time, your recharge. Is that being on the farm? Yeah. You know, some people get really excited to go on vacation. I get really excited to milk my cow. So it really comes down to what those are the things that I value the most. And so I've built a life around them. And so every day feels like I'm doing what I really love doing. So it doesn't feel like I need the same vacation that someone else does or that balance. Balance for us looks really different because our life is so seasonal, but we also really enjoy that. You know, if Ryan never had to leave the farm, he would be totally content. Hey, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If he could spend his entire day just staring at his cow, I'm pretty sure he'd do that. Like he <laughs> loves them. So he sweet talks them. Like he just is, he loves his pigs. He loves the idea of raising such quality food that really gets to live the way nature intended. And because that's where his passion sits, it's just, it's fun. It makes your life fun, which feels like such an, I feel like there should be more. Is that an acronym word. for something? <laughs> oh, I don't it, Right. Right. It feels like it's such a basic concept, right? but it's, it's something we've really worked hard to kind of create for ourselves. What's, what's the line between passion and obsession, or is it just, does it kind of float free flow? Like you kind of have to be obsessed with what you're doing. And I think too, especially when you're initially starting a business, you have to be obsessed or you're, it's not going to go very far, very fast. There's a massive investment involved in farming and there's very little, in, there's very little financing available to a startup farm, like zero. So we had to be obsessed in order to make it succeed as quickly as it did. That was something that we poured every minute we possibly, and for a while there, Ryan would even say things like, I'm, I kind of miss you yeah. <laughs> because we would be just kind of passing. Yeah. But we had to be obsessed in order to be successful for a while. And we've we've kind of struck a good balance. I don't want to say balance, but we've struck a good balance for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do have to ask. So if you did choose a place to go on vacation, like if it wasn't your farm, mm -hmm. do you have a place? To, do you guys have a place that you love to go? Is it like Eastern Washington? Is it like halfway around the world? Where would you go? So I'm a little different. I'm pretty sure my husband would, would choose the mountains and I would choose the beach. Yeah. I grew up in a water town. I love... 
I love the smell of salt water. So take me to the beach. But Ryan's definitely someone who would like to go to the mountains. <laughs> but so. in order to go to the beach or the mountains, you'll have to get dragged off the farm. Yeah. 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 And sometimes he doesn't want to be. I love the fact that we get to live a life that's that feels like a vacation. I don't feel like I need a vacation from and it's enjoyable. <laughs> I will follow in your footsteps. I'm trying to figure that out with real estate, but it's just, you know, it's, it's yes, a different beast. But, it is. But thank you so much for sharing your story, being vulnerable, talking about your world, talking about the layers, the ups and the downs. I appreciate you as a local business owner thank you. so much because I feel it every day too. I feel the, the different pains, but similar pains right. and triumphs. And I, I just, I love what you do. I'm now more familiar with that and I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. So thank you for sharing your story with yeah. us and our audience and thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you guys very much. Our guest today was Brianna Wyden of Widner Farms in Custer. Their farm store is open for limited hours each Saturday. You can learn more about Widner Farms on their Instagram feed or at widnerfarmsblog.com and also shop from their store at shopwidnerfarms.com. Thank you for listening to the Building Bellingham podcast. Building Bellingham is a community podcast exploring leadership, challenges, failure, and mindset with entrepreneurs right here in Whatcom County, Washington. You can catch recorded episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any of your favorite podcast streaming platforms. Be the first to hear about upcoming guests on the Building Bellingham Facebook and Instagram pages, as well as the Building Bellingham YouTube channel. This episode was produced and edited by Tiffany Holden. Our videography is done by Cooper Hamsley. Social media and community support is by Taylor Beal. To learn more about the team behind the podcast, check out our website at www.livebellinghamnow.com or search Cohen Group NW on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or LinkedIn. From the whole Building Bellingham podcast team, thank you for listening.